at the end of our last uh, lecture, we were on the uh, Hisoyo, the, uh, the Paramium and the Cedro, and uh, I had just uh, <clears throat> read uh, the first few uh, prayers of the uh, Sunday uh, of the Holy Cross. Uh, and so we went through uh, those opening steps uh, and we reached the <coughs> Cedro and the uh, Hosoyo. And uh, the, the point I was making there is that uh, this particular prayer uh, form is very, very much uh, part of the Antiochian tradition. And uh, there are several parts, as we said, of the, uh, the actual Hosoyo. Uh, the Paramion, which, uh, as we said, uh, introduces the uh, Hosoyo. Uh, right now I'm on page 34. Uh, the, uh, the Cedro itself, which we said is made up of two parts. The first part uh, describes the meaning of the, the feast itself. And then the second part uh, be, is a series of uh, petitions. Uh, and uh, very similar to uh, what we have in the Byzantine liturgy when we have the litanies. Uh, so this is the, 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 the core idea of the Hesoyo. But as I mentioned, and it's here on page 35, uh, there are other parts to the Hesoyo in our different liturgical books. So, uh, for example, here on the first paragraph, full paragraph on page 35, we mentioned that uh, <clears throat> sometimes you have five parts, uh, introduction, proemion, cedro, etro, uh, and hutomo. Uh, and other times uh, uh, you don't have an introduction and you don't have a hutomo, uh, but you also have what we call a kolo. Uh, now what's happened in our last two missiles that have been printed, uh, we've uh, standardized that uh, section of the liturgy so that it's made up really of, of, of four prayers, uh, the proemion, the cedro, the Kolo and the Etro. Uh, so this is what you'll find now in our Missal. But if you go back to some of the older liturgical books and some of the uh, big feasts of the church, uh, and, they, and I've seen those, you actually have more parts. You do have an introduction before you have, before you have a Promion. And then you have a Hutomo, which is a concluding prayer. Uh, but now we, we just deal with the four in, in the divine service. Uh, now, as I say, last time we went through the Paramion and the, uh, the Cedro, uh, and now we come to the Kolo. The word Kolo, as you know, means voice. Uh, it represents a, uh, uh, a chant. And uh, customarily now, uh, the people chant the Kolo. Uh, and... Uh, I found in my, in my own research of trying to find the, more of our Maronite theology is a lot of it is found in these uh, kole. Uh, and uh, we will see it here as we go out through the liturgical year. Now, for today's class, although we started with the Sunday for the uh, uh, exaltation of the cross, I want to go back now to the, the Sunday we're celebrating this week and next week. Uh, which, of course, is the Sunday of the consecration and renewal of the church. And so uh, I'm not going to go back and do uh, the opening uh, prayers and so forth, but let's just stay at the Kolo, which is on, in your book of offering on page 12. And you'll see here that the, the Kolo uh, is very, uh, as I say, it's very poetic. It's a hymn. Uh, and... Uh, there is a lot of theology here that uh, sometimes people might miss uh, uh, that really developed the meaning of the feast. And so uh, I want to go through that a little bit here with you. Uh, so here, <clears throat> and of course, uh, those of you who know both Arabic and English, 
uh, you'll see that sometimes the translations match and sometimes they don't. Uh, but most of the time uh, it works out pretty well. Uh, so here on page uh, 12 of the book of offering, uh, blessed are you holy and most faithful church for the groom betrothed to you brought you into pastures green. At your feast he mixed a cup, those who drink it thirst no more, come and eat fire in the bread, drink the spirit in the wine, clothe in spirit and in fire, you shall be with him his bride. Now, uh, we've touched on this theme uh, just recently, and of course, Father Armando here is quite involved in the idea of the groom and the bride. Uh, now, this, this comes, this whole uh, imagery uh, comes right out of St. Ephraim and, and, and Jacob of Saru. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, and as, as you probably know, now that you've heard it from me and from Father, uh, it's throughout our whole liturgical, uh, our liturgical year uh, for example, as I think we've talked about before, uh, with Ephraim and with James of Saru, uh, the actual betrothal of, of, the, of the church with Christ happened at uh, Epiphany. Uh, when uh, when uh, uh, Christ himself uh, receives uh, the... Uh, uh, the water from John, from John the Baptist. Uh, and the idea here, the idea of betrothal here is that uh, Epiphany is a preview of what's going to happen at the cross. And uh, as you know, in the Old Testament, uh, a lot of marriages were uh, initiated uh, at the well. Uh, as you see in the, you know, with Rebecca and so forth. Uh, so here, uh, you have uh, Christ at the Jordan River, and uh, in his baptism, which is going to be reconfirmed on the cross, uh, you have uh, Christ betrothing the church. Now, that isn't fully understood until you get to the cross. And in the, with the cross, you have uh, water and blood coming out of the side of Christ, uh, and, the, and the water out of the side of Christ was understood by our Syriac fathers as the water of baptism. Uh, and so uh, it's through baptism that the church becomes formed. And, and just uh, as out of the side of Adam came Eve, uh, so here out of the side of Christ uh, comes uh, his bride, uh, the church. But the actual betrothal uh, took place at the Jordan River. And as we see in our old Maronite anaphoras, there's the one anaphora, I think it was a John Chrysostom, or, uh, where uh, it says that John the Baptist is the best man. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, which is an interesting idea, because in the old tradition, uh, it's the best man who found a bride for the groom. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so the uh, so here you have this whole idea of uh, the church being uh, the bride of Christ, and a whole wedding ceremony that takes place. Uh, and th this is it here in this Sunday of the church. It is being recalled. Uh, so uh, so that's why actually when I was presenting my lectures to the, the parish, I treated the Sundays of the church as the end of the plan of salvation. But here we, we consider them as the beginning of the new liturgical year. But the story of salvation, of course, begins with uh, the season of announcement. Uh, so, uh, so in a way, uh, this uh, Sunday of the renewal or a consecration of the church is really summarizing what has happened throughout the whole liturgical year. But you can look at it as a beginning and end at the same time. Uh, following the uh, Bible, the Bible starts with the wedding and ends with the wedding. So, for our liturgical years, our liturgical year also starts with the wedding, and then if you go back to the same Sunday, it also ends with the wedding. That's right. So it is a beginning and the end of the liturgical year. The uh, but the uh, 
the original, uh, let's say the original uh, type uh, of uh, Adam and Eve uh, has to wait for the antitype. Yes. So, but so we have that whole idea here, and you notice here, uh, at your feast he mixed a cup. Those who drink it thirst no more. Uh, so the idea is a wedding feast, and uh, at the wedding feast uh, you have the actual uh, body and blood of Christ. Uh, then you have these next four lines, which are right out of Ephraim and Jacob of Saru. Right out. Come and eat fire in the bread, drink the spirit in the wine, clothe in spirit and in fire you shall be with him, his bride. So, uh, as I said to you before, uh, the imagery you're, you're familiar with now how is bread made? Remember, we're going back to the early centuries where your four elements were earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, bread is made with fire and wheat. Uh, and so you have fire in the bread. Uh, but that fire now is divine fire. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you have fire and, and wine. But the alcohol now, the spirit there, is not the alcoholic spirit, uh, but the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so uh, it is, uh, it's at least 100 proof. Uh, so uh, so, the, uh, so the, the imagery is very striking here. Uh, so uh, again, this whole imagery of, of a bride and groom. Uh, and then, of course, on, on page 13... It continues there. I was amazed at the feast that Christ prepared for the blessed church, his bride. As I entered, I saw there prophets, martyrs, and the just. Remember what you just read a couple weeks ago in the book of Revelation. The, uh, at the, near the end of the book of Revelation, what do you have? The new church coming down as a new Jerusalem, as a bride. And uh, the, the Lamb of God is, is the groom. And so again, you, you bring in that whole idea here of the, the ultimate uh, consummation uh, that the book of Revelation talks about. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, in the, the third verse, uh, you have this idea that I mentioned in the homily today. Grant peace, O Lord, to your church throughout the world. Keep all scandal far from her. <clears throat> Uh, guard your flock from harm and strife. <clears throat> Send good shepherds who will lead in accordance with your will. So uh, it, it's now becoming very practical. You know, what are we praying for? What are we petitioning for? Uh, a church that is free from scandal, the human condition, <clears throat> but also good shepherds. Uh, and uh, uh, so you have this idea now of, of, of the church as a flock. Uh, and so, uh, and then of course, gather and unite and love all her children in true faith. So, uh, so you have all of these themes that come in in, in the colo. Uh, that's why I keep telling you it's so important to uh, when you are preaching later on as priests that you really preach the liturgy uh, because it's so uh, you know if you're trying to find ideas for a homily. It's all there in the liturgy. You don't have to look somewhere else. Uh, and, and also to get the people to appreciate uh, what the liturgy is, is teaching us. Uh, and then, of course, you have the, the ethro. And uh, uh, the ethro here, uh, the word itself means uh, the smell, the fragrance of incense. Uh, so um, here, you, and, and usually the ethro prayer has a reference to the incense. Uh, and it, it summarizes the, uh, the his soil. Uh, so here, interesting, where it talks about Christ, you are the fragrant chrism. Uh, and of course, the word chrism refers to anointed one. Uh, and so uh, the whole idea of the chrism, although we always focus on the spirit, really is, is referring to the anointed one, the Messiah, the, the Christ. Uh, so it ties that in with uh, 
with, with the, uh, his soil prayer. Now, of course, uh, during the Hosoyo, we have incensing that goes on. And uh, I, again, it was interesting, some years ago here at the seminary, I tried a different experiment for a while. I got away with it, uh, where in, instead of uh, incensing uh, the altar and the people during the Hosoyo, uh, I just burned it. I had a, a little... Uh, uh, table kind of thing, and I just burnt incense and allowed the smoke to go up uh, while I, I was chanting the, the Hesoyo. Uh, and then when I came to the Etro, I did the incensing and, and uh, did the final prayer, you know. So, but uh, again, remember, if you're going to be a good, obedient priest, just follow the rubrics and the liturgy. Don't innovate unless you think you can get away with it. Uh, well, what was your rationale for doing that? My rationale was that we want the sweet smell to go up to God as our, our, as our sacrifice. Where if you're actually incensing, you're giving the idea you're purifying what you're incensing. Uh, and so that my thinking was, uh, wouldn't it be, make more sense to go back to the ancient practice, maybe in the pagan world, where incense was burned. Uh, and so, uh, but anyway, that was just a, a footnote to what I'm talking about here. Um, Martin, yeah. sorry, will you be discussing, since we're on the topic of incensing, um, the significance of incensing the altar a certain number of times, certain directions, and then, you know. You know, a, a, again, the rubrics are, are rather general. Uh, they talk about incensing the four corners of the altar. Uh, so, uh, but remember what we said before, in the Liturgy of the Word, we're really not at the altar. Uh, we're in the sanctuary, but we're not at the altar. Mm -hmm. So as you notice, even with our deacon incensing, he's incensing from a distance, if you, can't, if you, if you uh, think about the altar. Uh, after the procession of the gifts to the altar, then the, the, the celebrant incenses the altar. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, there's different customs that developed. And so priests kind of imitate the custom. Uh, but uh, I, I've never seen in recent years rubrics as to exactly what you are to do incensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, don't get carried away. Uh, uh, my, uh, my, see, the interesting thing is that in the old uh, practice, the priest was at the altar with his back to the people, and the altar was against the wall. Uh, so when he was incensing the people, uh, there was nothing uh, obstructing his incensing. But now that we have the priest facing the people, uh, that's why you notice like Monsignor Sibley on Sunday, uh, and uh, what I've always done is if you're going to incense the altar, I figure, like my Byzantine friends, I'd incense the whole altar. Uh, and so uh, th that's why I incense the congregation without the altar between me and the congregation, which to me seems a bit awkward. Uh, so, but I, I say, I, I don't know of a set of rubrics to follow exactly how this is done. Or just imitate the bishop. You can never go wrong <laughs> imitating the bishop. You know. Any other questions? So, so uh, again, here the priest recites the Ithro uh, prayer and uh, uh, it kind of summarizes uh, what was going on. Uh, now we come, uh, if you'll notice here, and I just want to follow what's in the book, notice here on page 35 at the bottom, I speak about a second cedro, or a framiette. Uh, now, here's the difference. When the new, uh, relatively new missile was printed in 1992, there was a option of substituting what they call the framiette for the hisoil. And uh, the framiette, in a sense, were... Uh, uh, Hesoyo put to poetry and music. Uh, 
So uh, in the old practice, the missiles up until 1992, uh, the, uh, in the liturgy itself, as we'll comment a little later on, uh, there was a, the chanting of the Iframiyet. Uh, you gentlemen have done this uh, sometimes in, uh, as a colo, you know, Hail Mary, Hail. Uh, uh, so uh, that's uh, the Iframiyet. Uh, but now with the new missile of 2005 or whatever that we have in English, uh, the Ephraimiyet are not listed as part of the Liturgy of the Word. Uh, Ephraimiyet, as I mentioned here in the, uh, in the paragraph, refers to, uh, they don't really go back to Ephraim that much, but refers to the meter of Ephraim, uh, which is seven syllables. And then, uh, as I mentioned on the following page, you have the, uh, those of Jacob of Sarug, which are 12 syllables. Uh, so, and here I list uh, the, uh, what happened in the history of the Ephraimiyet. And actually, as I think I mentioned to some of you, uh, when I was a young priest, there was a separate book uh, just for Ephraimiyet. And uh, like when you got to Christmas, uh, the Ephraimiyet might go on for 10 pages. I mean, uh, I mean it was a long, uh, you know, uh, series of chants. Uh, but of course now that has kind of drifted away. Now, uh, on pay, uh, so our next step here is the Trisagion. And uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, the Trisagion, you know, thrice holy, uh, is a very ancient part of the liturgy. You find it as far as I know in every liturgy I've looked at, uh, every liturgical tradition. Uh, and so it, it, it's very ancient. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's, as I mentioned here in the paragraph in the middle of page 36 of your liturgy book, uh, it, uh, here, Father Armando, can show you and you guys can translate the whole thing if you're, <laughs> if you're good in Arabic. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so as far as the Trisagion goes, as I mentioned here, it's referred to in the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, it's found in our ancient manuscripts. Uh, now, the the question is, what does the Trisagion represent? And the, in the Maronite tradition, at least in recent centuries, uh, it represents just uh, another prayer uh, in, the, in the missiles up until uh, uh, the missile of uh, uh, 1992, uh, the priest would uh, do an incensation. Uh, but the interesting thing there is that uh, in, in the old missile, you, you really, as I think I'll show you, I don't know if today or next time, you had about four different incensations. And you had two that took place before you got to the, uh, 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 to the uh, Trisagion. For example, in the old way we celebrated liturgy when I was first ordained, uh, you incense the people right after the prayer of uh, penance, uh, where the people usually sang, uh, you incense the people uh, during Psalm 51. And then there was another incensation where the priest took the censer and he would incense just the covered chalice and paten uh, three times and uh, three threes, and then he would circle it with the censer and not incense the people or anything else. That led me to think that perhaps originally uh, the Trisagion was represented a kind of procession uh, because, because why would the 
celebrant be doing these three circles, uh, and why would there not be a procession? And of course, in the Byzantine tradition, the Trisagion did represent several things. First of all, it represented the bishop coming into the congregation. Uh, uh, and secondly, it represented the scriptures. Uh, but here, in the Maronite tradition, we don't do anything. Uh, uh, we, uh, we just do it, but we don't do anything. I mean, the question is, why are we doing it? Uh, and that's why I, uh, I believe that it might have been a procession. And it might have been a procession of the gifts. I'm sorry, a procession of the Gospels, the Book of Gospels. Uh, that's just a guess on my part. But what I find intriguing is the prayer that follows the Trisagion. So if you look here on page 14 of the Book of Carbono, what does it say? Holy and immortal Lord, sanctify our minds and purify our consciences that we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. So it seems to me that Trisagion was introducing the second major uh, part of the liturgy, scriptures. So uh, again, and this is just personal, when I say personal, I'm not teaching you this, it's just my personal opinion. Uh, uh, I even tried that here at the seminary. Uh, and uh, for at least for a, a couple of months, where when we uh, came to the Trisagion, I had the deacon or the priest process the book of Gospels. And while the congregation chanted, Holy God, Holy Strong One, Holy Immortal One, around the church, and it, it seemed to uh, have a meaning that way. Now again, in fact, when we were still uh, asked as a committee on the liturgy that I belonged to one time, uh, sending suggestions to Lebanon, uh, I fought to put that suggestion in, but of course it got nowhere. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, so now we have the Trisagion, and what do we do during the Trisagion? The celebrants don't know where to look. Uh, they, uh, uh, they try to find a crucifix, you know. Uh, there's no incensing going on anymore. Uh, so we just do it. Uh, it's nice, and all the kids know it right away in Syria, Kaddishat, you know. When I used to visit homes to bless the, you know, after Epiphany, their kids, they say, look at our kids here, they're Kaddishat, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, so my, as I say, I wish we did something with it and just, yeah. just saying it. Uh, but uh, anyway, the other thing that's uh, very uh, interesting is that in the Maronite tradition, the Trisagion is addressed to the Word of God. Uh, it's not addressed to the Trinity, although we say it three times. Uh, and how do I know that? Well, you guys know the, the liturgical year. What happens when you get to the season of, uh, 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 you know, the response changes. Yeah, whether it's for Epiphany, whether it's for uh, resurrection. resurrection, whether it's uh, you know uh, Good Friday, uh, you are, you say, Holy God, Holy Strong One, Holy Immortal One. And then you talk about who was crucified for us, uh, and so forth. Uh, so, in the Maronite tradition, it's addressed to the Word of God. Uh, in the Byzantine, obviously the Trinity. The Maronites got into trouble on account of that. Uh, because uh, some of our friends accused us of being patri you know, killing God, uh, you know, uh, holy God, Holy Strong One, Holy Immortal One, who was crucified for us. Now, of course, in our current liturgical practice, we say Christ. So we explain who we're talking about. But originally, they just said Holy God, Holy Strong One, Holy Immortal One, who was crucified for us. <laughs> uh, but uh, we Maronites are not that stupid. Uh, so, uh, uh, but again, as I say, uh, uh, 
it is a, 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 a difference in our Maronite tradition uh, from uh, the other Eastern churches. I wanted to ma mention that uh, Robert Cabier, in his book, The Church at Prayer, Volume 2, on page 57, says, In any event, the hymn became very popular. He's talking about the Trisagion in all Eastern churches, which connected it with the book of the Gospels. It was sung as the book was brought in at the beginning of the Liturgy of the Word and placed at, on the, at the altar. The rite was given in a specially solemn form among the Byzantines, in Eastern Syria, the procession went to the center of the nave where the book of the Gospels was placed on the bima, likewise the accompanying, uh, accompaniment of the Trisagion. Among the Copts and Ethiopians, the hymn was sung before the reading of the Gospel, since it was then that the procession took place. But this does not seem to have been the original practice. So, so that, that uh, uh, collaborates with what you said earlier about yeah. It connects with the uh, book of the gospel. And when we were at the seminary, you used to process with the book of the gospel. Uh, when we get to this to this part, you started doing it for us because we right. asked you for to do it. So that's something for you to think about, petition for when you're <laughs> 10 years into the priesthood. <clears throat> Before 10 years, nobody pays attention to you. Preach, oh Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 15, 15. <laughs> so, uh, any any further questions about the Trisagion? It yeah. seems like this prayer, the holy and sanctify our minds and purify our consciences, like that would be a time to incense the people because you're talking about them being purified. Yeah, well, I, when I say procession, I mean with the incense. See, now what happens, as you know, with the new missal mm -hmm. is we have a procession, uh, you know, uh, of, the, of, the, of the book of Gospels with, uh, with incense. Uh, but uh, so, uh, so the incense would be part of that whole thing. I mean, it's, it's a, it would be processing with the Word of God. It should be, incense with, it should be processed with incense, with candles, with all bells and whistles right. that... That we can have. Right. Everybody should walk behind it, at least the, uh, the clergy and the sanctuary, not just. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Do you know where it comes from? What, the Trisagion? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the book, it, uh, I think I, I say a few things about it in the introduction. I, I think it started he saying started I'm sorry you say the first reference is in the document of Rahmani on the sixth no century. there was another point where I talked about the Trisagion okay. um, but I don't I, I'll have to look it up again um, but as I mentioned here it's, it's mentioned in the council of Chalcedon uh, so, uh, uh, it it becomes a um, the Trisagion hymn becomes a an issue of uh, contention at the Council of Chalcedon, uh, because uh, the so the ones that did not accept Chalcedon used the Christological formula, and there is this uh, story that in one of the processions in Constantinople, a child was taken to the heavens, and heard that heard the angels sing. And when the child was brought back, everyone asked him, what did you hear? What, what were the angels saying? And then he recited, holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. And that's kind of like in the historiography, the beginning of the Trisagion. But what that story tells us that the, the origins of the Trisagion is in processional liturgy, mm -hmm. uh, in processions. Mm -hmm. And you still see the remnants of that processional element in Byzantine liturgy. Um, and uh, it, uh, that story also kind of like uh, uh, makes canonical for the Chalcedonian or the Byzantine tradition the Trisagion as Trinitarian, but research has shown that the Trisagion was originally Christological. And the person that has written a lot on that is uh, a Spanish scholar, Sebastián Llaneras, who talks about uh, the history of the Trisagion. Um, and actually, in the Coptic tradition too, 
uh, the trisagion is uh, Christological. Um, so um, we know its origins lie in processional liturgy. We don't have like an exact uh, pinpoint, but and definitely it existed even before Chalcedon. But that story of the kid being taken to the heavens comes kind of like a beginning point of the Trinitarian understanding of the Trisagion. Yeah, he didn't speak Syriac, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Mistranslated. <laughs> so now, uh, then we, we come to the, uh, the, the whole idea of the, uh, the scriptures. And of course, here again, uh, as we said, uh, this is the oldest part of the Liturgy of the Word, going back even to the, uh, the Jewish synagogue service. And so what we have here is... Uh, uh, the, what we call the Mosmuro, uh, which are really uh, originally based on, on scriptural passages. Uh, but here, you know, we, we sometimes don't use scripture, but just key ideas. Uh, so here, for example, in, in the Sunday of the Consecration of the Church on, on page uh, 15, uh, in English here, we say, priests and deacons are standing at the altar of God's peace, and they offer sweet incense as the spirit hovers there. Uh, I, I, that really struck me here, and uh, uh, it's found here, of course, also in the, in the Syriac and the, and the Arabic. Uh, the image of uh, the spirit hovering uh, over the, uh, the altar. Uh, so it isn't just a matter at the at the... Uh, at the Epiclesis, the kind of spirit comes zooming in from nowhere. Uh, but the spirit is already hovering over the whole uh, service, from the beginning uh, all the way through the end. Uh, so it's, it's the spirit is covering what's happening, just as the spirit was above Christ at his baptism. I mean, if you buy into the idea that the altar is a symbol of Christ, then it makes sense for the, uh, for the spirit to be hovering yeah. on top of the altar. Yeah. Uh, so, so you have that, and then uh, hero, hero peoples and nations at the altar, priests now stand, all on earth be attentive as the Spirit hovers there. And then, of course, it gets back to the theme of the feast. On the rock of St. Peter, Jesus built his holy church. Uh, uh, although I think in the other tra text there, it talks about the, uh, the faith of Peter. Uh, just faith. The rock of faith. The rock of faith. He completed her structure through the labors of Saint Paul. Uh, so then we have the uh, the scripture readings, uh, and of course, uh, again as we saw even with the synagogue service, you have the Alleluia, Alleluia, and and here again you have another snippet from the scriptures. Uh, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Uh, and then uh, you have the deacon now finally come in, coming in here, as he does in other liturgical traditions, and he's trying to tell the people this is pretty important. Uh, so, so here is before the proclamation of the gospel of our, our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for mercy, O Lord. So again, uh, even in our liturgical tradition, you have incense going, is, is going to be burned here, and, and the deacon is announcing that. And then, of course, you have the uh, announcement of, of the gospel. <clears throat> and again, uh, here we have something that we find in all liturgical traditions. One of the jobs of the deacon is to quiet people down. Uh, so, proskomen or, or whatever, you know. Uh, so here, we Notice what he's doing here. Remain silent, O listeners. Why does he have to say that? Because there's too much of a noise. <laughs> uh, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the Word of God. Uh, so, uh, so human nature has always been the same. Uh, and especially, uh, you know, you've got to go back when you have a church, if, uh, when the church was finally triumphant and you had a church with several hundred congregants, you, and you had to keep uh, a certain order. Why in the missal previous to this one it used to say, uh, give glory and thanks to the living word of God, and now it says word of the living God? Why did they change that, do you know? 
Oh, gee, I don't know. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, again, you know, the thing is, uh, uh, it, it's a nice, living is a nice adjective, uh, but uh, obviously God is living, and uh, if I had my choice, I'd probably say living word of God, but, uh, uh, but uh, again, you know, uh, there are places where the liturgy is very redundant. You know, it's saying the obvious. Uh, I'm just wondering in the Arabic if the hay is referring to a kalima or a Do you know? It's a law. It's masculine, so it's referring to a masculine law. Kalima is feminine. So this is a direct translation? Yes. Yeah, but if it's referring to Christ, it would be same, no, not masculine kalima. Well, even if it's kalima is feminine, so. No, no, I understand it's saying that it's, when it refers to Christ, I use it as masculine. Yeah, treat it as masculine. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it that way. I have a different answer. Now, uh, and then finally, yeah, after the gospel is over, uh, the celebrant says, this is the truth, peace be with you. Uh, and then you have this <clears throat> some response from the congregation. Although what struck me is that final response here of the congregation uh, might make more sense if it came after the homily. Uh, because in a way, it's, it's kind of closing off the liturgy of the word. And so, uh, but again, this is just something that I wonder about. That's not the response of the manuscript, the, uh, the, the, the prayer. This is like they came up with yeah, this no. for somewhere. There's something else in there. But right. I don't know what it is. Uh, I, think I, I, know, the, I know that in, in the Arabic Mr. the creed comes after the homily and not in the pre-anathema. Oh, we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I just brought it up because you said uh, we use this word to close up this. I. Yeah, but the creed, uh, the, the creed really makes more sense introducing the anaphora because the only ones reciting the creed are, are believers. Well, the, remember in the origin of the liturgy, you had the catechumens and the, uh, uh, the sinners and the uh, possessed. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would not be pronouncing the creed. Uh, so it belongs more to the what we call the pre-anaphora, whether it's after the homily or after the... Uh, uh, the words of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, offertory. Uh, so, again, I, 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 I don't think the creed would be at play here. Yeah, okay, because, for example, Shara, which is... Yeah. Shara, doesn't have the creed in it. Well, why should it? You know? <laughs> I no, mean, because if, if we're putting it at the beginning of the anaphora, it should be there, no? No, no. Uh, see, here's the issue. The creed was a later addition to the, the liturgy. So that's why, as I'm going to mention when we get to it, that the Latin church has a creed after the homily. The Byzantine church has it not uh, after the homily, but after the uh, first prayers of the pre uh, I mean of the procession and so forth. Uh, so... Uh, so the, the Maronites imitate the Latins. Okay. What, senior? Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a question? Sure. It's a question about the readings. Was there historically a time when the readings included an Old Testament reading, or is this in, in uh, accommodation for our more recent uh, uh, Middle Eastern history? I'm glad you asked that question, because I almost forgot to bring it up. Uh, in the, the liturgy book that you have, uh, the, on, on page 37, the second paragraph, uh, I point out that traditionally there was as many as six readings, especially on your feast days, on your big feasts. And in fact, uh, when we have our ordinations, of uh, minor orders, for example, and uh, into the uh, diaconate and priesthood, uh, 
each minor order has a ability to read certain parts of the scripture. So for example, if you have the book on page 37, when somebody's ordained cantor, uh, he now can read the Psalms. And in fact, part of the ordination ceremony is to chant a part of the psalm. If you're ordained lector, then you read the books of the prophets. Uh, if you're a subdeacon, uh, the books of the Acts of the Apostles and the Catholic Epistles. The deacons read the epistles of Paul. And the archdeacons read uh, uh, the gospel. Uh, so we did have as many as six. Now what happened here... As time went on, we ended up doing only the last two, the epistles of Paul and the Gospels. If you'll recall, most of the time, even now in our Maronite liturgy, most of the time we deal with Paul and nobody else. Not always. However, there's no doubt that we had readings from the whole Bible before. Now, this issue came up... Uh, with uh, our, our commission, when we were, some of us were bringing it up to the commission in Lebanon, and they claimed <clears throat> that a lot of the other readings are done in a divine office. Uh, and that's why we ended up with the epistles of Paul and the gospel. But that doesn't make sense, because uh, uh, we're not trying to just uh, help people who live in monasteries. Uh, the, all of the faithful should be able to respond uh, or to hear all the scriptures read, Old and New Testament. And in fact, uh, before the new missiles came out here in the United States, when we had our, old, uh, our own Maronite lectionary that we did here in the United States, we did have a selection of readings throughout uh, the whole Bible. So, uh, yeah, the problem is, Human nature being what it is, we ended up with the last two instead of having six. So you don't think it's political then because of the relationship with, with Israel? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't think that's it. I think what you had, when you bring up the political issue, if I can be controversial here even on Skype, is uh, maybe that's why it's taken so long for the Masapki brothers to be canonized. Uh, but... Uh, I don't think it has anything directly to do with the scriptures. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So we're going to end here, gentlemen. So next time, bring these with you. And if you want, you can take a look and see what the Liturgy of the Word looked like uh, before the uh, present missile. Well, so this is directly before this version? Uh, no, directly before uh, even.